How's it guys? Welcome to the fifth episode of the Money Marks Money Audit Show. In this series, I am reviewing members of my audience's budget, investments, risk cover and everything and giving my input on how they can possibly improve their financial portfolio. I found that it is a bit easier to do it this way because then people can apply what they've learned in a practical setting and just to make sense of all the financial jargon that is out there. Now I do have to remind you that whilst I am now a registered financial advisor under the FECA, nothing in this video should be constituted as financial advice. Not for you, not for the person who I'm reviewing it, and not for anyone else. The whole purpose is for financial education and financial literacy. So please take what you can from the video, but do not to consider this as a recommendation to implement any specific products. Right, with that out of the way, let's get started. Now today's episode is very interesting because we're going to focus on medical aids, which is something that's quite complicated for people to always understand, tax planning, especially for those working overseas, earning in US dollars, and also retirement planning, which is always important. And today's guest is 65, so it's clo very close to retirement. And it's always good to just have different types of people on the show because it helps us to better understand how different people need to approach their finances in different stages of their lives. Okay, lacquer. So the person that we are reviewing today is a 65 year old female living in Durban that is widowed. She has three children, age 35, 35 and 37, all completely independent on their own, as well as four grandchildren. She doesn't have any pets and she rated her level of financial knowledge to be a five out of 10, so kind of midway through, and the likelihood of immigrating also about five out of 10. And she mentioned that uh, while she does have a British passport, she is hoping to eventually uh, retire and die in South Africa. This is very important for me to know because that becomes very applicable to the investment side, which we'll get to later. And she has a will and a living will updated and she's also an organ do donor, which is another very important thing that we'll touch on later on. All right, so what exactly does our guest for today do? Well, she is a part-time chief nurse on a cruise ship in the Mediterranean. Now, the really interesting thing about this guest is the first email that she sent to me, she sent from Mykonos and the second email from Zakynthos in Greece. So yeah, she's essentially traveling around, seeing the world, working on a cruise ship as a nurse, and she's only working six to eight months a year. She's earning US dollars tax-free, and she's sending all of that money home directly. And we'll explain kind of how the tax works when you work overseas, especially on a cruise ship, just in, a, in, in just a bit. With her work, she doesn't really have a kind of employee benefits. She does have a small retirement plan that will pay out about 7,000 US dollars when she retires. That's about 130, 140,000 Rand. Um, but apart from that, she doesn't have any employee benefits. Right. So over this six months period that she works, she earns 124,000 rands per month. So now if we even that out over a 12 month period, that's about 62,000 rand before taxes. Now, because she's working on a cruise ship, she's technically not in any country. So she doesn't have to pay any taxes in any specific country. So that is quite interesting to know. And um, I'm talking in very general terms here. I am not a tax practitioner, not qualified to give tax advice, but I can explain how South Africa's tax system works, just so you can understand when this would be applicable. But it's very important to know that if you are in that situation where you want to go work on a cruise ship or overseas, always consult a registered tax pr practitioner so that they can guide you as to what your tax affair should be like. So again, general information. Now, as South African residents, we are taxed according to a residence-based tax system. So that essentially means as South Africans, we are taxed on our worldwide income, irrespective of that source of income. So wherever we earn money in the world, we are taxed on that. But there is an exemption that if you render your services outside of South Africa for a continuous period of more than 60 full days, and a total period of 183 days or longer in a tax year, then you are exempt on that foreign employment income up to the point of 1.25 million rand during that specific year. Now it's likely that you will tip, you have to pay tax in that specific country, say for example the US, but South Africa also have a double tax agreement with the US, 
that reduces your your tax burden on stuff like investments but also you use then those credits to to reduce your taxes in south africa working on a cruise ship it's different because you're not in a specific country so in this person's case she doesn't pay taxes which is very nice because that's 62,000 rand a month goes back right into her pocket she earns obviously in dollars that's why it's, it's a lot for us to to see um and i mean yeah she's earning very good money and only working half a year so I mean, if, if, you, if you can, go do it. I think it's a great way to explore the world and to just have fun. I do think you work very hard. Um, it's not just, uh, you know, you're, you're not really on a cruise. You are actually helping others enjoy their stay. But still, um, earning good money and something that I would recommend for young people in general. But I mean, she's 65 and she's still living the life. So no excuses. Um, right. But very important to note that even though if you work overseas or on a cruise ship, if you have investments, bank accounts, property, stuff in South Africa, you still need to file tax returns every year. And sometimes you still need to pay tax on those interest or dividends or capital gains that you make in South Africa. So again, always important to have a tax practitioner on your side to guide you with these conversations. Because if you now work overseas for 10 years and you haven't filed a single tax return in South Africa and you come back, then Sasha is going to, to shop other bonus for you because they may give you a penalty. And unfortunately, telling Sash, I didn't know, does not work. They don't care. They are not uh, merciful in that sense. Uh, ignorance is bliss. You need to know. Um, and that's why it's important to make sure that you understand the, your specific situation, your foreign employment contract, so that you know that the taxes that you pay are in line with, with your needs. Obviously, we don't want to pay un unnecessary taxes, but we still need to understand it so that we don't get penalized later down the line. Okay, cool. So moving on to her expenses, she pays about 13,500 Rand in rent. That includes utilities and Wi-Fi. She has a, sm uh, a nice little beach apartment. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's on, the, on the higher side for, for one person, but she does have family that comes to visit and grandkids. So I can kind of understand that, but potentially if she needs to cut some money, then she can look for, for a cheaper place. Household expenses, 500 Rand, that's good. Transport, uh, she only really needs to pay for transport about four months a year, and that's about 360 Rand per month, which is very, very, very good. Food, 2000 Rand per month, all her meals are included on the ship. So this 2000 Rand is essentially just for the six months that she's in South Africa. So I think that's, that's very reasonable. Takeouts, also 2,000 Rand a month. I do think she can cut down on that a bit if she needs to, to cut on something. It just depends on how often she likes to take her grandkids out for maybe a milkshake at Spur or something like that. But 2,000 for one person is, is quite a lot. Alcohol, 1,000 Rand, that's fine. <laughs> if you enjoy wine, you know, it's, it's okay. Um, it's not excessive. One very important thing and, and something that we haven't really talked about on this show is medical aid. So she, she, she currently has a medical cover with Cigna Healthcare, which is kind of like a free medical treatment that she has whilst currently on board on the ship. And she mentioned that once she retires in South Africa around the age of 70, she will obviously need a medical aid and a hospital plan. Now, it's very important to understand how medical aids work. Um, and, I, and I'm going to spend some time on that today. So with medical aid, there's a difference between medical aid and medical insurance. Usually with offshore type of medical care, medical plans, it's called health insurance. It's different to medical aid in South Africa. The big difference is with medical aid, there are very strict laws in place to make sure that um, the people that belong to medical aid are protected. And there are two, two main things that you need to know. The first thing is a late joiner penalty. So medical aids, and hospital plans. If I talk about medical aids, it, it kind of includes hospital plans, um, but essentially both of them operate on the ethos of open enrollment and community rating. Open enrollment means no one can be refused access to medical aid, private medical aid or hospital plans. Um, and the community rating is everyone pays the same premium. Even if you are older or younger, regardless of your age or your health status, everyone pays the same premium. But there is a difference. There is something called a late joiner penalty. So the reason why there is a late joiner penalty is because everyone has access to medical aid. No, no one can be refused, essentially. So the whole idea behind community rating 
is that the young and healthy will subsidize the old and sickly. Now, in order to do that and for it to make sense, if you join a medical aid from a young age, you obviously start contributing towards this pool because you have a lot of members all contributing towards this, this pool and the pool builds up reserves that pays out claims. Now, if you join early on, you pay many years of premiums that when you eventually claim when you're older, you have kind of funded your own payments. Makes sense. But now if you only join when you are old, um, 65, for example, you are much more likely to claim. And now you haven't paid that 30, 40 years of, of premiums to fund that. So they apply a late joiner penalty to that. Now, there is a calculation that they do to determine what that penalty is. There are different penalty bands and how they determine that is they look at your age and they look at your credible coverage. Credible coverage includes things like you've been part of your mom's medical aid up until the age of maybe 25, 26 as a student. Then you joined your employer's medical aid in South Africa for a couple of years. Then you went on to your private medical aid for a couple of years. They all add all of that. Unfortunately, international medical aid cover or medical insurance does not count. So in this person's case, you will we'll have to look at exactly what cover she had in place for her entire life, do the calculation, but she will likely have to pay a late joiner penalty because of the reason that she has a higher chance of making claims. And therefore, in order for this whole system to make sense, she will have to pay more for a premium to kind of make up for this this initial period that she wasn't part of a medical aid. Um, so very important to understand. Second thing is they apply waiting periods. So that just depends on how long have you been part of a medical aid and how long has it been since you left a medical aid in South Africa s since you joined a new one. So there's two types of waiting periods, a three month general waiting period where they don't cover anything. Uh, so you'll pay your premiums, but everything is not covered and a 12 month condition specific waiting period, which means that if you join the 1st of January, 2024, for the previous 12 months, if anything has been diagnosed by a doctor for the next 12 months, it will not be covered. After that, it will. So important to understand. And yeah, it's just how the system works. I hope the way that I explained it makes sense because uh, people oftentimes get upset when they realize they have to pay a penalty, but it is for this whole thing to to eventually uh, make sense for everyone that are members for example i'm 28 now i've been part of medical aid since i was born essentially so for 25 28 years i've been contributing premiums or my mom has been contributing premiums and now i am so you know it it it, it won't be fair for someone joining later on to to have the same type of uh, cover as someone that has paid for this long um yeah so just important to take note and obviously the older you get the more important is it is to have medical care in place because it's more likely that you will claim and medical care does get expensive for most medical aids the annual increases is usually between seven to nine percent per year where inflation is like five to six percent so it is important for her especially to do look at medical aid and hospital plans and taking that late joiner penalty in consideration and building that into a budget and hence why if you do have the means rather join a, the, a cheap hospital plan early on in your life before the age of 35 because after 35 they apply that penalty and if you're young and healthy a basic hospital plan is all you need if you have more comprehensive cover needed uh, if you have chronic medication or you have chronic conditions then a more comprehensive medical aid would be needed, but it is more expensive. So it's just important to do a full analysis on, on what your needs are. Also don't want to pay more for medical aid that you don't need. So there is a fine balance, but definitely something that is beneficial if you can afford it. Then on insurance, she pays 675 Rand. It's for her car and household contents. She was thinking about disability and employment cover because with her, as I understand it, with her current employment, contract they don't really cover that so it is something to think about because she's still thinking of of working until the age of 70 just take note that things like income protection and disability cover some of them only cover until the age of 65 which she currently is at some will cover to the age of 70 but it will be rather expensive to to join right now being 65 but something to explore and see if, if she can fit that into a budget whilst also taking her retirement funding into account, which is something that also needs to be addressed. Um, so having a holistic view, I would say in her case, we can look at life cover, income protection, disability, and all of that. 
But I think critical illness is most important for her, or severe Ill illness. This is now when you get sick, you get cancer, for example. Now you have medical aid, but it only pays 200,000 Rand per year for oncology. But now you need to go for chemotherapy. That costs 800,000 Rand. Now you need to make up the difference. This is where critical illness cover comes in. So I'd say if I have to identify one of the four, I'd say critical illness is very important in conjunction with medical aid or a hospital plan and then also some gap cover. So very important for people that are getting older to have that in place. Uh, other expenses, clothing, 1,000 Rand, personal care and hygiene, 500, personal entertainment, 300 Rand, personal development, 250, technology, 500, holidays, 1,200 Rand, cell phone expense of 200 Rand, that's good, and internet, 450. I can't really say much about that. I think that's, that's reasonable. Subscriptions, 5,575 Rand. That is for Netflix, Apple iTunes, and iCloud. That seems very excessive to me. I, I don't know why that is so high because I also have Netflix and it's rather cheap. So I'm not sure if there's other subscriptions involved as well. Uh, definitely something that I'll look into getting lower. The subscriptions is a nice to have and obviously you can uh, entertain yourself quite a lot. It, it's much better than getting DSTV, don't get me wrong. We use Netflix, um, Showmax, and Spotify, personally, because um, that we use that to get more e-bucks, but also we get discounts on it. But it's more than enough to, to have very good entertainment as, a, as opposed to paying for that daylight robbery. Uh, but in her case, I would definitely look into that. Uh, I'm not sure why that is so high. Banking costs, she pays 600 Rand. Um, that's because she has a, a APSA bank account, but also a US bank account bit high probably because of the us account and i assume she does need that to get paid so yeah i think that's fine gifts 3200 rand a month i mean she's a granny you need to spoil your grandkids but maybe something to look at trimming down if we now start looking at what she actually needs to invest to retire comfortably um, because then we need to have that fine balance of, of knowing that we will have enough and essentially we'll have to if we don't have enough we'll have to start cutting down especially now because we know other expenses will need to come into the picture like medical care and uh, critical illness and then she also donates about thousand rand a month which is great i do think it's important to donate uh, for me personally uh, i don't think the amount is so important i just think the act of giving is very nice to to develop it i, th I don't think there's a better feeling in life knowing that that you help someone um i think that's that's there's a reason why it gives you that warm fuzzy feeling and it also i found just removes the kind of constraints that money has on us that we're trying to just keep everything to ourselves. I don't think money is evil, um, but I do think sometimes what money can do becomes evil. And if you give money, uh, even if it's small amounts, even if it's a 10 rand to a car guard that's really standing there in the sun the whole day to, to try and provide for his family and you have the means, um, I do think it is, it's very good to do um, and something that I'm trying to, to improve in my life as well. Right, so if we look at all of our expenses, it comes out at about 34,810 rand a month. That means she saves about 27,000 rand per month with a savings rate of 43.8%. So this is great and definitely what's counting in her favor is that uh, she doesn't pay taxes on her money but again the, she will still have to pay taxes on her investment side because that's not exempt but um, yeah I mean well done I think that 27th K we can really do a lot with and we probably will have to do a lot with as, as you'll see in a, in a minute. Uh, she doesn't have any debt so well done on that. On the investment side short-term investments uh, with APSA she has a small savings account of 700 bucks a credit card excess of 7,000. So what that means is she preloads her credit card and then she swipes it she, so she doesn't go into the negative. She doesn't pay any interest. Uh, she just uses her credit card as kind of like a debit account, but she adds more money to her credit card than is needed. Why? Because that helps to build a credit score. It prevents you from going into credit debt and definitely something that I would approve of, something that I also do, except I, I use my credit card I swipe and I go into the negative side, but then I repay it at the end of every month. And that's how you build credit. You need to build credit, a good credit score, in order to save money on large purchases like a car and a house later on. So, and it also teaches you to, to use credit cards responsibly. It's also a flip side to it. If you just keep on swiping your card for the latest, latest shoes or iPhone or 
uh, whatever kids buy these days, um, then you can quickly go down a credit card debt spiral, which is very dangerous. So using it responsibly, and I do have a whole playlist on how to do that using credit cards. And it's something that I would recommend everyone to take note of and to build. Even if you don't like debt, it's not taking out debt, it's just building a credit score. There is a difference. And it's unlikely that you will even be able to buy a house or a car essentially cash. You will need to take out a loan sometime in your life. If you don't, then well done. You are definitely in the minority. Most of us will, and it's better to, to build up a good credit score because that will literally save you hundreds and thousands of rands over the long term on, on a home loan. Believe me, I've done the calculations. So yeah, no excuses. Then she also has a 24 hour notice deposit of APSA, um, about 538,000 rand in there, earning about 8.65%. On a long-term investment, she also has a fixed deposit with APSA of 1.2 million, earning 7.9%. The term is one year, 12 months. She has some discretionary money with Satrix, also 1.2 million. Uh, holdings is the Satrix top 40, about 82.8%. Satrix MSCI China, 0.3%. And the Satrix MSCI World ETF, 16.9%. She has a tax-free savings account with Satrix, about 70,500 Rand in there. Also, 50% is invested in the Satrix Top 40, 26.2% is invested in the Satrix Finney 15, and then 23.8% is invested in the Satrix MECI Emerging Markets. She also has a retirement annuity, again with Satrix, about 870,000 Rand, and that's invested in the Satrix Low Equity Balanced Unit Trust. And she also has a RA from Old Mutual that she's transferring to, to Satrix at the moment um, to save on some fees. And then she also has that work pension fund with her employer of about 130,000 rand that will pay out uh, at retirement. She doesn't have any property investments and she doesn't invest in any speculative investments, There's things like Bitcoin and stuff like that. Right, so now looking at her total investment portfolio, the age of 65, her total value is just above 4 million, about 4 million 27,500 rand. Of that 4 million rand, 43.4% is invested in cash, about 1.74 million. 30.1% is invested in discretionary investments, about 1.21 million. And 26.5% is invested in retirement funding. And that's just above 1 million and 70,000 rand. So discretionary investments is basically anything that is not a retirement investment vehicle. And retirement investment vehicles is things like a retirement annuity, pension fund, uh, provident fund pension preservation fund provident preservation fund stuff like that um, so yeah but that's not too important now having a look at her total investment portfolio most of her investments are with satrix which i think is good satrix is a good low cost uh, platform so she does save a lot of fees on that most of her investments are in satrix funds and if we look at the kind of asset allocation most of them are concentrated in local funds. A lot of it is in the Satrix top 40, which is the top 40 um, companies in South Africa. So generally, um, you know, she mentioned she wants to retire in South Africa and that's kind of the plan. So for her, it makes sense to allocate most of her money to local funds because she wants to retire in South Africa, in South Africa rands. So exposing most of your investments to local assets would make sense in that sense. Others who are not planning on retiring South Africa that wants to retire overseas, they will have a much different strategy that she has. But I think, you know, the, the funds that she currently have is, 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 is more or less in line with what I would say would be beneficial. A couple of things that I do want to, to point out, she is very cash heavy. So what, why is that important? There are two main reasons. The one is that most people are aware of if you invest in a bank savings accounts, even stuff like notice accounts or fixed deposits, yes, you're earning a, a six to eight percent if you're lucky, depending on the interest rates. But there's also inflation eroding the value of that money. So yes, your investments are growing by six to eight percent, but inflation is also six to eight percent. So, uh, you know, what you pay for a bottle of Coke today versus ten years ago, there's a big difference, and there will be a big difference in ten years' time from now. So we also need to always think about inflation. That's the one thing. Second thing is taxes. So on cash, you, you earn interest and on interest, you pay interest tax. There is an exemption for people under the age of 65. You get 23,800 rand per year exemption. 
And for people above the age of 65, which she kind of falls into, is 34,500 Rand interest exemption. So what that means is if you, for example, in her case, she um, earns 7% interest on her cash investments, that means that if she invests 492,850 Rand in that investment, earning 7%, she'll earn about 34,500 Rand per year in interest, which will be exempt. Anything above this amount will be added to a marginal tax brackets and be taxed according to that. Marginal tax brackets range between 18 and 45%. So just as you can imagine, if you earn a ton of money, every single rand above that limit gets taxed by 45%. So that obviously becomes a big concern. And it is actually one of the most common mistakes I see people make, especially people close to retirement. Because yes, they kind of think I need to now have all this cash available because I don't earn a salary, I need to draw money from it. And yes, there, there, is, there is reason to that, but it's, it's a fine balance because if you keep all your money in cash, it's just, Sash is just going to clap you left, right and center because you're paying tax on the money you earn, income tax, you're paying tax on the stuff you buy, VAT, um, you pay tax on your investments, on capital gains and, and dividends. Now you're also paying tax on the actual investments in cash because now you exceed your interest exemption. And now if you die, you also pay tax, estate duty and a lot of other hidden taxes in between. So you need to, uh, it's important to have a uh, holistic overview of the total portfolio. And yes, do keep some, some investment in cash, but only as much as you need. You can also put some of your allocation in investments that pay out dividends, which gets taxed at 20%. Now, 20% is a lot better than 45%. So it also depends on your tax bracket. In her specific case, her marginal tax bracket is low because she does not pay taxes on a foreign income. But once she retires and she starts earning money from her investments, that's going to push up her tax bracket. And that's why it's important to make sure that her cash um, is, is allocated accordingly. So obviously, I mean, she currently has 1.75 million in cash. So there's, there's work to be done there. Um, I do think it can be invested much more efficiently. And um, also, you know, I'm going to quickly show you what uh, her retirement planning funding looks like. But uh, at her age, 65, she can still work until the age of 70. But at this stage, I would say go double down on, on retirement funding. Um, don't worry about discretionary investments. Um, don't worry about Bitcoin. Don't worry about cash. Top up, um, max out that tax free savings account, that 3,000 Rand a month or 36,000 Rand per year. And then weigh everything extra into a retirement annuity because she wants to retire in South Africa. So that's fine. No problem. It reduces your taxable income. Again, you don't want to pay too much taxes and it grows tax free. Um, it does you don't pay any interest dividends or capital gains tax on the growth of your in, um, investments in a tax-free and retirement annuity so for her case i'll say clop that that ra as much as possible and just again to reiterate you still need to submit a tax return even if you are working overseas even if you just have a bank account in south africa uh, earning one rand every year for uh, interest because Sash still wants to see that and you will likely get an administrative penalty if you come back uh, uh, after 10 years and they like, you know, where, where's all the, the money? Um, so be responsible um, and, and get a tax practitioner that can help you with that. Okay, cool. So now looking at the financial goals, um, the, the main one is basically just the, the big question we all have is, do I have enough? Um, so her situation is she's 65. She can still work until the age of 70. Um, maybe that gives us about four to five years. Um, you know, she's, she's awesome. She's working uh, hard on keeping herself healthy. I mean, she's a human nurse. She knows how. Uh, she's passing her medical exams, updating her certificates every two years to be able to work. She goes for yoga. She goes for walks. Um, she can even lift 50 kilograms. How many of you can say that? And she also drinks wine for stress. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose that works. Uh, it's working for her, so maybe, maybe I should try that sometime. Um, she essentially wants to earn between 30,000 and 40,000 rand per month in retirement. So it's, it's having these conversations, it's, it's always difficult to, to know how much do you need because now kind of like she's earning 62,000 rand per month 
which is a lot and she's spending about 34,000 rand currently um, where she's currently at so it's it's having an arbitrary number in mind is it's, it's always like yeah I think that will be enough but what actually needs to be done is you need a, a financial planner that can do proper uh, planning financial needs analysis we call it to make sure that that is actually possible to to get so so I did a, a rather quick calculation um, because with this client I don't have all the information that I need Again, not financial advice, just my kind of guidance in terms of, of what I would do. Um, so if we go on to the situation of where she needs 30,000 Rand per month, and we say, right, starting at uh, the age of 65 until 70, we still have five years left, um, she will essentially run out of money at the age of 85. So yes, we never know how long we will live, and maybe maybe that will be fine. But I would rather be more cautious and plan ahead. Um, so we usually with my clients, I plan until the age of 95. So if you don't reach 95, then that's that's fine. Um, you know, we will be all right. But you never want to be in that situation where you do become very old and you're running out of money because then you become your children's burden and um, or you have to reduce your, your lifestyle, um, which is not ideal. So let's rather try and be proactive and plan ahead. And if, you know, it, it's not like once you retire, you need to now have everything in place. Every year there will be a revision done. There will be a cash flow planning that needs to be done where we look at your budget, your income that you draw from your investments, your expenses, making sure that everything is in place. And for that, you need a good financial planner, um, not someone that just sells you stuff and disappears. Um, right. So now say let okay let's now but i want thirty thousand rand a month what do i need to do now to get to that point if she wants to get that until the age of 95 she will have to invest another thirty nine thousand six hundred and eighty rand per month now she can get close to that she has about twenty seven thousand, but obviously that that is a lot of money so what are her options one thing she can postpone retirement work longer unlikely that that is possible at her age because you know at the age of 70 that's kind of the the, the, the top limit of, of when you are allowed to work but she can continue with other types of work so second option is starting a side hustle in retirement to generate income because that essentially means that you're earning more and you're uh, just making up for that deficit and uh, other option is to reduce your income in retirement, your income requirements. So obviously, if 30,000 is too much, we can look at, okay, but what about 25,000? What about um, 20,000? Um, and, and then you will obviously have to look at your budget, seeing where you need to cut down to, to make that possible. But again, reviewing this every year, looking at how your investments performed, look at, looking at your budget and planning accordingly. Um, so a couple of important things that I also want to mention here um the whole idea of retirement planning is is not to be restrictive and once you retire you know you've been working your entire career to be able to retire to enjoy the the golden years so the idea is not to save as much as possible and not enjoy life that that is not what i'm saying um, what we want to achieve in your retirement is essentially the day that you die you need to die with zero rand in the bank i know that sounds counterintuitive to just everything i've mentioned but in an ideal world that is what you want because if you die with too much money, what happens? You pay taxes and we don't want that because you're already paying a lot of taxes. So that's why cash flow planning is very important and why a financial planner needs to do that for your retirement planning. Essentially, you want to use and enjoy your money as much as possible whilst making sure that you don't run out of money. And that just means continuous revisions. Now, um, looking at her portfolio, you know, she already has 4 million rand um, invested which is a good amount um, I think she's doing very well it's just the, the reality of the fact is it's very difficult in South Africa um, to retire only one out of six people can retire with the same standard of living um, so the odds are definitely not in our favor and with the political instability and of the country and the rent value dropping and uh, cost of living going up it is very difficult um, so for those youngsters out there looking or uh, watching this video Always remember, please try and start saving for retirement early on. Even if it's 10 rand, 100 rand, 1000 rand a month, we need that compound effect to, 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 to kick in. And, um, you know, it's just going to make your life easier. You have to start with much less early on as opposed to later on. But it's never lost cause. 
also if, if you're close to retirement and you're watching this and you're realizing uh oh crap i probably need to start looking at my finances it is never too late the best time to plant a tree was yesterday second best time is today so as long as you start looking at your retirement again there are many different things that we can do to to make these numbers a bit more less scary um, but it might require some some hard work and sacrifice uh, which we unfortunately will have to do in order to to reach our goals sometimes um, and then just to some technical stuff once you get to retirement you'll have to decide um, how you're going to draw an income because now you're not earning a salary anymore and there are generally two options with stuff like retirement annuities and pension funds you can either decide to take out a life annuity which pays out a fixed amount um, like a predictable amount every month until the day that you die benefits of that is you know exactly what you're getting you know how much it increases every year and and it's a very predictable thing drawdowns of that is should you die all that money is gone you don't leave anything to your children so you do have to risk that you've built up say four million rand over your lifetime now you buy a life annuity and next year you pass away sorry that money is gone because it's the insurance product um, so if, if leaving a legacy is important then rather look at something like a living annuity which is essentially just a normal investment um, that you put your money into and you draw down a percentage of that ideally not more than five percent that's like the upper limit um, and and that gives you more flexibility because every year you can decide how much income you need um, and that's again going back to the cash flow planning we need to do that analysis to see how did your investments perform because the one year you can maybe uh, get a bit more the other year you have to cut down a bit um, so it gives you more flexibility if you pass away whatever is left will go to your your beneficiaries in the form of uh, inheritance um, and yeah you can every year decide your what you need the risk of that is if you draw down too much you run out of money so it's not like the one is better than the other um, you can go for a blended version and it also depends on more technical stuff like what is the interest rate when you retire the higher the interest rate the more beneficial is a life annuity stuff that i'm not going to go into today um, if you guys want to see a video on that then let me know in the comments and i can make a more in-depth explanation between the two um, because that is very important to understand for retirees so if you are in uh, it will be interesting to see um, people watching this video you know let me know are you close to retirement is that something that you'd like to see or are you a younger person but you know your parents are in that kind of phase and you want to help them make that decision let me know and, and i can definitely uh, create a video on that um okay awesome and then with this whole thing with kind of the message of this video is it is important to to look at your financial portfolio in the holistic overview it's uh, i've made a video recently where i explained why why i joined the financial industry as a financial advisor um you know originally being a vet and i just found that the financial planning aspect was always very focused on just one area it's just like selling insurance products or managing investments or you know just focusing on a small area in your portfolio but as you see with this video and you can watch the previous videos that i've made as well there are so many things to actually look at uh, building a holistic overview of everything especially when you get to retirement it's, it's important to know all of these things because if you don't you're going to get blindsided and you're going to make mistakes and mistakes can be costly uh, mistakes that you make early on in your life you won't realize now you'll see the ripple effect of that over 40 years especially things like paying too much fees and and paying too much taxes and putting your money on in insurance products that you just um, insurance investment products that you're paying too much fees in commission to the advisor things that could be best avoided only way to avoid that is firstly improving your own financial literacy because if you don't know you don't know so spend time on doing that school is not going to teach you that the university is not going to teach you that even if you do go study finances they are not going to teach you that um, you need to take responsibility for that and um, yeah just some tough love here you need to spend time that's how i that's what i did as a vet spend time in the evenings and here i am today teaching others once you learn stuff also teach others help them out um, if you're going to start realizing the more you speak about money the more people will start asking you questions and, and just you know paying it forward whatever you learn today here help help someone out um, and secondly whilst we know that it's important to to teach ourselves these things 
also know that um, fi finances is also complex. Having this holistic view, it's the same thing as, as getting sick, um, getting a cold. Yes, you can go to the pharmacy, you can go buy some um, over-the-counter medication that might treat your cold and you'll be fine. But, you know, breaking your leg, you're not going to try and treat that yourself. Um, obviously, you're going to go to the doctor, to the surgeon, they're going to operate. It's going to cost money. But you know then, okay, fine, I'm not going to get infection and die. Um, so with finances, it's also good. In, it's also important to have someone on your team, a good financial planner, not a broker that just sells you stuff, a financial planner that looks at your entire portfolio, just making sure that am I okay? Do I have enough? If I don't, what do I need to do to, to have enough? And also looking holistically at your personal goals, your family, your occupation, your recreation, money, even your spiritual goals that you want to achieve in life and building a plan around that. That is what financial planning is all about, not selling stuff. Yes, products are important. They do play a role in re helping us reach our goals, but it should not be focused on products. It should be focused on you, your goals and what you want to achieve. The reason why I joined this industry is because I wanted to make a difference. For me to make a difference, I need to be different than what is the industry standard. And that's the approach that I take. I do this whole holistic view. I spend time getting to know you, your goals, and then we take it step by step, also not to overwhelm you. So I really hope that this video has been helpful and that you learned a ton. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions. And if you are interested in having me doing like an audit like this, um, you can just send me an email um, in the description. I'll leave my email address and then I'll send you the details. Um, again, this is just for educational purposes. If you want to take a next step and you want me to do a full analysis of your portfolio and really take your hand to make sure you reach your goals, also, I'll also leave a link to my website that you can go read up exactly what services I offer and what my fees are. I'm very transparent on what I charge. And then you can book a call with me and, and we can take it from there. But yeah, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it was valuable and I wish you a lack a day further. Goodbye.